Two days ago, on August 7th, 2019, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, held a workshop that focused on the ever-brewing discussion surrounding loot boxes. These paid randomized monetization systems that have paved the road for glorified gambling to seep their way into video games have been admonished since as far as I can remember, but it wasn't until Star Wars Battlefront 2 incited an angry crowd with its pay-to-win loot boxes that the issue really gained a lot of traction action beyond a niche crowd. Now, government officials are getting involved as a stubborn and greedy video games industry refuses to regulate itself, refuses to take responsibility, refuses to enact checks and balances. This is in large part because the industry's regulatory bodies, the ESA and the ESRB, are run by the very same executives who seek to nickel and dime consumers at the expense of integrity. To that end, major AAA publishers and both the ESA and the ESRB, who are lobbied and run by these publishers, Publishers will present all kinds of ass-backwards claims and justifications. We have heard them all by now. Loot boxes are all about player choice. They add fun and value to make an experience more engaging. They're not gambling. They're surprise mechanics. Loot boxes are necessary because games are too expensive to make. Yada yada yada. So it should come as no surprise that during the FTC loot box workshop, organizations lobbying for the current status quo of loot boxes continue to issue the same time excuses. Now, in a piss-poor attempt to seem concerned about the issue of loot boxes, the ESA announced during the workshop that Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft, the big three of video game platforms, will be mandating the disclosure of loot box odds moving forward for games that ship with loot boxes or are updated with loot boxes post-launch. This isn't an initiative that will take place immediately, but they propose that this policy will apply across the board by the end of 2020. So probably when next-gen consoles start shipping. Alongside the big three, a myriad game publishers from Activision Blizzard, Bandai Namco, Bethesda, Bungie, EA, Take-Two, Ubisoft, Warner Brothers, and Wizards of the Coast have also pledged to disclose loot box probabilities once the policy goes live. Now, the ESA is trying to pretend like this is a big gesture on their part, but what we're looking at here is an incredibly minuscule step forward that won't make that much of a difference on its own, which I'll get into later. For now, let's move on to the case presented by the Interactive Entertainment Group, who pretty much just said that loot boxes are optional and that they have lowered the prices of playing games. Both statements complete horse shite. Loot boxes are never optional. Consumers don't get to choose whether loot boxes are in games or not. Game publishers make that decision for us. Furthermore, loot box infested games will be designed in such a way that if you don't make in-game purchases, you'll be forced to grind insufferably and have a miserable time. These kinds of games will purposely introduce design flaws whose fixes and solutions players must pay for in the form of microtransactions and or loot boxes. Saying loot boxes are optional is like saying that giving lunch money to a bully is optional. Sure, you don't have to give lunch money to the bully, but you'll have a miserable day in school otherwise. Similarly, you don't have to pay for microtransactions and loot boxes, but you'll have a miserable time with these games that are purposely designed to make the experience of people who don't pay up more miserable. As for this whole idea that games are too expensive to make and that microtransactions have helped game prices stay the same, I don't believe for a second that these companies who overpay their CEOs and their executives and who completely avoid paying taxes, in many cases actually getting money from the government in the form of refunds and subsidies through loopholes and legal exploits, are having a tough time keeping up with development costs. As for this idea that game prices have remained the same six $60, let's not forget that games now ship with a wide variety of different editions that cost far beyond $60, and all these different editions come with a wide variety of exclusive content to incentivize people to pay for these higher-priced editions, all on top of things like season passes and pre-order bonuses. Game prices have, in fact, gone up, but game companies are just more subtle about it by coming up with schemes that dissuade players from simply choosing the $60 standard version 
version, the edition that has stripped content from the base game that's being dangled like carrots in front of the more expensive editions. Another common argument is that many games nowadays are live services that get constantly updated with free content, and that the free content requires funding. Okay, well, if you want to implement in-game purchases for long-term monetization, then the only way that can be acceptable is if you don't charge upfront. Make your live service games free to play and implement sensible microtransactions that do not detract from the core experience and or psychologically manipulate players in a harmful way through glorified gambling. It's either that or charge for both the base cost of a game and for expansions and completely exclude microtransactions. This is a price that people are willing to pay if it ultimately means that a game's design integrity is maintained rather than obliterated by shady monetization tactics, and if it ultimately means supporting developers who deserve it. Moving on, when two concerns surrounding loot boxes were brought up, the way players have to purchase premium currency rather than be able to purchase items directly, with the complexity of the exchange rate between digital and real dollars masquerading microtransaction purchases real-world value, and the way loot box odds can be manipulated by game publishers on a whim, the ESA's excuse was that it'd be annoying for people to have to make real-world dollar transactions over and over again, rather than paying to buy in-game credits and bulk that they can then spend without having to go through the transaction process again. And another excuse was that for publishers there would be significant transaction costs if people kept doing separate transactions rather than doing one bulk transaction for in-game credits. Yup, they actually pulled the think of the multi-billion dollar corporation that avoids paying taxes and gives executive salaries by the dozens of millions card. Even more ridiculously, the ESA reasoned that premium currency preserves narrative integrity, claiming purchasing in-game content with dollars would take players out of the experience compared to buying things with premium currency that are labeled with things that supposedly match the lore. Ah, yes, narrative integrity, because obviously when you think of World War II and Normandy Beach, you think of soldiers spending premium currency and loot boxes dropping from the sky. Because obviously when you think of Elder Scrolls and Tamriel, you think of treasure boxes with timers on them that can only be dispelled with gems for whatever reason. Because obviously when you think of the Star Wars universe, the first thing that comes to mind are these goddamn crates that you pay for to unlock character skins and weapons randomly. Let's get one thing straight here. The very inclusion of microtransactions and loot boxes, the inclusion of any such system, already by itself breaks any semblance of narrative integrity or continuity. It doesn't matter what the currency is called or what the nature of the currency is, the system itself breaks narrative. So don't you sit there and pretend like narrative integrity is remotely something you're concerned about when implementing scummy monetization tactics. As for the topic of loot boxes, odds being able to be tweaked to the publisher's whim at a moment's notice, the ESA claimed that consumers would be upset if they didn't update their loot box odds, providing the example of a sports title where famous player statistics and rarity have to be kept up and updated and changed to reflect these famous players' real-world performance. Let me tell you what actually upsets players. When they cannot unlock and play as their favorite sports players through clear-cut in-game goals, because of the game's been artificially designed to encourage gambling for the ridiculously low chance of unlocking said player. This is what happened to the kids in that BBC story who cleared out their parents' bank account when they kept purchasing FIFA card packs because the game just wouldn't grant them Lionel Messi no matter how many times they opened card packs. That's upsetting. So yeah, as far as the ESA's defense of loot boxes go, you get the general idea. It's flimsy and moronic as all hell as always. Now, this right here was only one segment of the FTC Loot Box Workshop. Things get good when we delve into what consumer advocates had to say in retort, who thoroughly shut down every one of the game's industry's arguments defending loot boxes. Once again, the topic of the ESRB's so-called efforts and solutions came up, with the ESRB proudly touting the introduction of that in-game purchases label, as well as the new initiative for all major platform holders and all major publishers to disclose loot box odds. In retort, Consumer Reports Director of Financial Policy, Anna 
Anna Layton had some sound arguments to make, as news outlet Games Industry transcribed, "Quote that wasn't good enough for Consumer Reports Director of Financial Policy Anna Layton. Her presentation came second and centered on the argument that the goal of microtransactions in general, including loot boxes, is for people to purchase them, and that companies will use subtle tactics to manipulate players into buying more of them. Because of that, she said, simply letting consumers know that the purchases exist in a game isn't enough. There's a label for in-game purchases, and that can mean a huge range of things. That's everything from you can buy a new character when it's released to we have surprise loot boxes. A whole wide range. I know when I look at a game, there is a lot more detail that consumers need to understand how they might be presented with the option to spend money. As I've said before, it's like trying to inform people of the difference between cannabis and methamphetamine by labeling both of them drugs. They're both technically drugs, but clearly the latter is worse than the former. And with one-time purchase story content versus infinitely monetizable loot boxes, they're both technically in-game purchases, but clearly the latter is worse than the former. The label doesn't help in distinguishing between what's not dangerous and what is. Layton also brought up how developers use premium currency to add that extra layer of distance between real-world spending and in-game purchases, obscuring people's ability to place real-world value to their purchases and acting as another method of manipulation. From there, in this next paragraph, Layton also shut down a number of other misleading justifications that the video game industry uses to excuse their actions, stating, "Quote: Layton finally detailed what she referred to as dark patterns or ways that games urge players to do certain actions, such as purchase a loot box. Specifically, she mentioned appointment dynamics, building habits for playing regularly, such as login bonuses, pay-to-win mechanics, where making reasonable progress requires in-game purchases." And grinding, making the alternative to buying a loot box, doing a lot of relatively pointless work for a very long time. Noting that these are all design decisions surrounding in-game purchases and are not covered by a single label. Any time a game company mentions how loot boxes are optional, keep this paragraph right here in mind. When say Bethesda tries to tell you that microtransactions in Elder Scrolls Blades are optional, point to the fact that while you can technically make progress without additional spending, you can't do so at a reasonable pace. That the alternative to shelling out cash is doing a lot of pointless work or a lot of pointless waiting for a very long time. Layton hit the nail on the head with this one. This is how game companies strong arm players into spending by annoying them and making them psychologically suffer for not paying up by making a game purposely inconvenient. Next to speak was executive director of the National Council of Problem Gambling, Keith S. White, who began by stating that loot boxes do, in fact, pose the risk of enabling users to develop gambling problems or to further fuel gambling addiction for people who already face that issue. He then noted that while disclosing loot box odds is a small step in the right direction, by itself it is not nearly enough of a tangible measure. Stating the following: If you're spending two hundred and fifty million dollars to develop a Game and you've got some of the world's best and most creative talent. Let's find a way to make information and disclosure entertaining, interactive, and exciting. Build it into gameplay. Reward players for doing pro-social behavior, like finding out what the odds really are in this game. I would hate to see it look like what a pay table looks like for a slot machine, which is two-point font, zillions of numbers, and without a degree in higher math, you're utterly unable to understand this. There are ways to make this transparent. Quite effective, especially when you're trying to communicate with younger consumers or parents who are not technically well equipped. So that's something really important to bring up. The ESA will often tout how there are these parental tools parents can take advantage of to limit spending. They'll flaunt how there's that useless in-game purchases label. They'll glorify the whole notion of disclosing loot box odds. But the fact of the matter is that most parents don't even know about these elements because video games do not actively notify players about these tools in an easy-to-understand manner, or they don't disclose how easy it is to spend money on mass to. 
do so compulsively. When you look at physical boxes and online store listings, they simply list that vague in-game purchases label in fine print rather than feature clearly visible warnings surrounding loot boxes. And there tend to be zero in-game notifications about ways to prevent unintended mass spending. The thing is, having prevention tools and methods does not matter if they aren't prominently advertised, if games don't actively present warning signs. And the video game industry knows this. They want to make it seem like they're being proactive, but they're actually doing next to nothing to promote and advocate responsible in-game spending, because responsible in-game spending means less profit for these game companies. From there, White suggested giving all games with in-game purchases a mature rating, as parents will drop their guard against games advertised as kids-friendly that also have in-game purchases. Parents just won't know to be on the lookout for the ability to spend money in-game when a game is labeled E for Everyone or Peggy 3 because the logical conclusion is that games designed for kids shouldn't allow kids to spend money. And I'll do White one better if a game contains features that resemble real-life gambling and involve real currency. It should be labeled adults only, not mature, adults only. The ESRB stipulates this in their own website, but they aren't upholding their own guidelines because they're more interested in making money. So they'll circumvent their own policy by insisting that loot boxes aren't gambling, that loot boxes are surprise mechanics or whatever. Another great point White brought up was that the video game industry needs to be regulated by an objective third party. As I previously mentioned, the ESA and the ESRB are run by the same executives who stand to benefit from keeping loot boxes unregulated. How can we expect objective self-regulation from these organizations when the guys who run these organizations, the regulators, are the people who benefit from a lack of regulations. White put it best. He said, quote, nobody in the gambling issue would ever trust a slot machine manufacturer to self-certify that their machines and the odds and randomness of their machines perform as they say. We use independent testing labs to verify that the odds are as stated, and they often find machines that do not perform adequately. It's an important consumer protection feature. So if the industry is going to provide us information on odds and randomness, take a lesson from the gambling side. You've got to get it done independently. It's not going to be effective if you're just saying, trust us, these items drop at this rate. White then suggested that the games industry should strive to implement self-exclusion programs for adults with gambling problems who do not have the oversight of parents and who cannot help themselves. And he also suggested that the video game industry share de-identified anonymous player data so that third-party organizations can analyze this information for research and so they can come up with appropriate solutions to ensure consumer safety. Closing off this segment of the FTC hearing was Senior Counsel for Policy and Privacy at Common Sense Media, Ariel Fox Johnson, who began by bringing up the point that children in particular often do not know the difference between spending real money and spending pretend money. A lot of children may not understand that premium currency is actually also tied to real-world currency. This is indeed true. Recall the recent BBC article that compiled accounts of around a dozen parents across the UK, and many of them noted that their kids did not know that they were spending real money. The way the premium currency was presented made the children think that this was just pretend money. They didn't know actual dollars were being spent. That's what premium currency does. That extra layer of separation between real-world money and in-game purchases either obscures the true value of in-game items or fools susceptible children into thinking that they're spending, say, gems instead of dollars without knowing that those gems are actually tied to dollars. Johnson also highlighted other tactics game companies use to manipulate children, like matchmaking children with older and more experienced players so that the children will develop the impulse of buying in-game items that will make them stronger, or having in-game characters appear upset when the player doesn't make an in-game purchase. Furthermore, Johnson agreed with Layton and White in regards to disclosing odds not being enough to mitigate the loot box issue, because the way item prices and value and general loot box warnings are disclosed by game companies is very opaque, and with mobile games in particular, many parents may not realize that 
Credit cards attached to their phone can be used in game by their children without authorization. Not all parents are technically savvy enough to know this kind of stuff. The FTC hearing then finished off with a Q&A segment in which both White and Johnson argue that the ESA's commitment to disclose odds of loot boxes is just not enough to solve the issue of loot boxes. That this by itself will not prove to be effective. Here's an excellent quote from White that perfectly explained why this is the case. Most people don't understand odds and randomness in the most simple dimensions, especially when you're talking about dynamic odds. It's also impossible for people to figure that out. And you have to look at the people you're disclosing to. If it's a young person or someone who is vulnerable to gambling addiction, they're going to understand that information completely differently than a rational, well-informed, or non-addicted consumer. From the gambling addiction space, there have been few studies that have found much impact of odds and randomness disclosure on slot machines. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't lead to negative perception, except in some ways there are ways to talk about odds and randomness in gambling that can actually encourage or lead people into false beliefs. But by and large, I think that information is okay. The next step is to find ways to make it sticky and entertaining for consumers, and to make such disclosures impactful. The disclosure itself is not the point. The point is for it to lead to something. Look at Powerball. Your odds are 200 and 46 million to one. Does that stop anybody from buying Powerball tickets? Some people love to chase long odds. That's part of the thrill. That's frankly part of the addiction for some people. Indeed, gambling addiction has in large part to do with things like chemical reactions that happen in your brain, the release of dopamine and all that, a sensation some people just cannot resist. Both casino games and lottery and in-game loot boxes work exactly the same way in that regard. They trigger the same psychological effects effects and the same chemical reactions. From there, Layton added that she doesn't believe that odds disclosure will make kids make better decisions. After all, children don't know the full implications of something having a 1% chance. All they understand is that if they keep trying, if they keep spending, if they keep rolling the dice, they might eventually get the thing they want. Johnson then chimed in and pointed out that game companies actually don't want to disclose loot box odds in a way that may scare people away from making purchases. They don't want to put up big red warnings signs and to honestly disclose potential dangers because that goes against their financially driven agendas. The second people perceive loot boxes as potentially dangerous, they're not going to want to engage and that affects the financial guidelines that they strive for. Finally, after all the consumer advocates spoke, the ESRB closed with one final face palm inducing statement that reads, quote, I think you have to trust that the industry is serious about making the commitment they announced this morning. They have their own customers to serve and they have made a commitment to make disclosures easy to access and be understandable. As we learned earlier this morning, loot boxes vary game to game, loot box to loot box. There is no one silver bullet for disclosures. There is no one standard. I think we have to leave it to individual game developers to develop the right type of disclosures for their game and their customers. First of all, were you not listening? The argument was that the disclosures alone aren't enough by themselves. Secondly, your commitment, ESA and ESRB, means jack shit because you have proven time and again that you're just not trustworthy. Trust is earned, and both the ESA and the ESRB SRB as well as the game companies that lobby these organizations have only fostered distrust between them and consumers over the years with their predatory practices. They have proven over and over again that if left to their own devices, if left unchecked, they will always choose to screw over consumers in the name of profit. We have already tried leaving it up to game makers to act responsibly. We have tried being vocal about our issues and criticism with the way they're implementing microtransactions and loot boxes. We have been doing this song and dance for months and years now, and it's clearly not working. So it is time for a third-party organization with higher jurisdiction to break the door down and regulate an industry that actively chooses to remain complicit in anti-consumer practices and that has proven that it's unable to regulate itself responsibly with their repeat offenses. Somebody needs to step in and set some boundaries that will guarantee game publishers will stop stepping over the line. You know, if you think about it, there's actually very little about the arguments and information presented 
presented in this workshop that's actually completely new. The games industry presented the same laughable bullet points, and consumer advocates presented the same far more logical counter arguments that video game enthusiasts have been presenting all this time. But the difference now is that all of this was presented in front of the FTC, a government body that could take tangible action, that can offer oversight over the games industry. The Federal Trade Commission got to clearly hear from both sides on a stage, and the hope now is that they saw how full of shit the games industry is and how sound the arguments made by consumer advocates are. Time will tell how this all pans out, but if you ask me, the games industry presented nothing of value in front of the FTC. They didn't present a single compelling argument because the fact remains, from a moral standpoint, the games industry has no ground to stand on. They have no moral or ethical argument to make because for game companies, loot boxes are at their core all about making money and have nothing to do with making better products, offering better consumer experience or whatever it is they'll claim. Because the simple truth is that loot boxes by nature are not ethical, they are not optional, they are not fun, they do not offer value, they don't offer choice, and they are far from truly necessary for a game company to stay afloat or thrive. There are plenty of game companies out there right now getting by just fine without these microtransactions and loot boxes. So yeah, there you have it, folks. Everything you need to know about the FTC's loot box workshop. I'd love to hear what your take is on the arguments that were presented from both sides in the comments below. With that, I would like to end this news update and discussion video. Thank you for tuning in. To be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Yong Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Yong out.